Okay, uh, good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us from wherever you are in the world. Uh, we are really excited about our topic this morning. We have two phenomenal speakers. Uh, first, uh, Ashwini Sharan from Thomas Jefferson University in Pennsylvania is going to talk to us about review of insular anatomy and implant strategy, including semiology also. And then Massimo Kasu from Milan is going to speak with us about uh, insular opercular resections. Uh, as always, uh, we're going to do both talks, and then we should have plenty of time for discussion. So if you have questions, uh, just please put them into the chat or question and answer, and we'll try to get through as many as we can at the end. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Ash, thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thank you. And uh, let me PowerPoint. Okay, uh, everybody can see my PowerPoint? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, so today I'm going to cover insular anatomy, semiology, and implantation. And uh, you know, just starting with a tribute uh, to the gentleman in the upper right corner, uh, Johann Riel, uh, as a German anatomist, physicist, sort of a Renaissance man, uh, who in 1809 uh, coined the island of Riel. Um, interestingly enough, he also coined the word psychiatry. Uh, so he was a, you know, sort of a great anatomist working on the insula. Here's my disclosures. And, <clears throat> and of course, uh, a few high level thoughts on the insular anatomy and, uh, and I'll bring it all together. Um, he called it the island of real because it's hidden uh, by both the frontal and, and uh, temporal opercula. And um, really uh, philosophically uh, in our program, just want to share uh, our understanding of the insula in, at Thomas Jefferson is probably under 10 years old. And, and this probably related to the works that everybody in Europe has been doing. Uh, and Stereo EEG, which was much more popular in Europe and has just recently grown in popularity in the US. So I'm actually uh, glad to be on this call with so many European uh, and Asian and other partners. But um, the biggest part of the insula is access uh, to the insula. And the fact that the middle cerebral artery is networking uh, across there. And so how do we safely resect this tissue if there's epileptogenic? Um, and that part Massimo will cover, but I'll talk about how do you figure out uh, if the epileptogenic zones are in the insula. And really just for discussion's sakes, it's the M2 branches, the superior and inferior branches and the perforators that supply the insula. So it's very important to remember that, and especially in the posterior insula, you know, when the lenticular slot branches um, can easily affect the central sulcus or the motor cortex. Um, the way I like to think about the insula is, and I drew a cartoon out of the insular triangle, and there's three uh, short front gyri, and there's two posterior long gyri. The central insular sulcus uh, is defined and tends to be continuous with the central sulcus uh, which separates motor and sensory cortex. And functionally, uh, I also look at the insula with the middle cerebral artery. It doesn't exactly go to the middle, but it's of concern because it's sort of, I look at it as an inferior corridor, something that you can reach coming from the temporal lobe or the superior corridor. Um, and you obviously tend not to retract or displace this, the middle cerebral artery. Um, Functionally, also, I think of the insula in, in three regions, and I'll get into more details uh, as, as I look at the anatomy studies and the connectivity studies. But I look at a frontal region, which is a little bit more about cognitive control, uh, integration of attention and salience processing. I look at a posterior center, which is more somatosensory and parietal, and an inferior anterior section, which is more temporal amygdala. So it makes a lot more sense to look at it this way. Um, you know, before when you're studying the insula, how do you put it in context? So it makes sense that the fibers towards the frontal lobe, parietal lobe, and temporal lobe are, are organized in a, in, a, in a very standardized manner. And some people also have an accessory gyrus as well, uh, just for completion. So generally five gyri, sometimes six gyri in the insula. And this is really just a parcellation. Uh, that we have our students actively doing, really just to color the gyri and saying that you can actually see that inside the uh, MRI. Now, when I look at insular connectivity, wow, that's going to be tough if my dog uh, goes crazy this morning, so I apologize. 
Um, when I look at insular connectivity, uh, I look at the, and this is important because the insula can be a masquerader. Um, and depending on which regions of the brain it's actually connected to. So the insula in the frontal regions is connected to the anterior cingulate, orbital frontal, inferior frontal and uh, frontal opercular regions. The temporal part of the insula, and this is based on connectivity studies that I'm actually sharing. The temporal pole regions are connected to the superior temporal uh, opercular regions, auditory regions, rhinal and entorhinal cortex and amygdala. The inferior part, the in <coughs> anterior inferior part of the amygdala is connected to olfactory regions and the posterior parietal regions uh, are the posterior parts of the insula are connected a little bit more to the somatosensory and parietal regions. Um, and also just to complete it out why the thalamus is listed, the entire insula has very rich connections to the thalamus as it's involved in integration. Now, this I'm also sharing as a tractography uh, study. Uh, the references on top, Klautman et al. in 2012. And in this study, they actually uh, used seven different seat points in the insula to look at different regions. And just to highlight, uh, the orange and red are connected to the anterior parts, right, in the frontal orbital frontal regions, uh, and via via the uncinate uh, fasciculus. Uh, the green and blue parts posteriorly are connected via via the arcuate fasciculus. Um, so those are the main take homes. And there's high variability uh, in the tractography that comes out of the insula. Uh, but uh, in the future, I suspect that when we start doing stereo EG, um, I don't know if anybody is actively using tractography to guide implantation, uh, but it could be a tool as this gets refined. Uh, this is a paper in 2012 with probabilistic tractography, and there has been a lot of advancements in tractography, although I have not seen somebody actively using tractography for insular implantation. But if you think about how we think about networks and spread pathways, it is one of the tools that we should be thinking about uh, in the future. Now, uh, when we look at the, the role of the insula, so I like to think about it in four functions. So the, the green anterior part is cognitive control centers connected to the frontal lobes, the red sensory motor, uh, the blue emotional and social function, and in the middle somewhere, chemical sensory integration. And, and so uh, it becomes important because if you try to now then correlate the semiology with the anatomy, you need sort of a context for thinking about the insula. So the big, the two, uh, uh, is, uh, Isnard uh, from Lyon uh, has really done a phenomenal amount of the work. And, and I think it, the paper from 2004, uh, which is actually shown here, where they did uh, 50 patients uh, looked at surgical results and electrical stimulation through stereo EEG leads. And then the largest review of that is in 2017 and the references in the upper right-hand corner where they had 200 patients uh, and 550 positive responses to stimulation. So they've really done the line share of mapping out uh, what the insula seems to do. And they've mapped out uh, uh, six different uh, types of responses that they were able to get on a consistent uh, basis. So they had vestibular uh, symptoms, they had somatosensory symptoms, uh, viscerosensitive symptoms, laryngeal constriction, uh, auditory and dysarthric speech. So based on somatosensory, uh, and I'm sorry, based on stimulation experiments, these are the type of responses they get. And of course, uh, by and large, uh, a lot of it corresponds with the aura or the semiology experienced uh, by the patient. Um, I think we're all aware that a common semiology of insular epilepsy includes laryngeal constriction, unpleasant perioral paresthesias, lateralized somatosensory uh, sensation and dysarthria. And, and this is the framework uh, from the SNARS group that allows us to uh, appreciate that. Um, Isnard's group, as well as Barbara Jost, uh, recently wrote this article. Uh, this was in uh, 2019 in Epilepsy Currents. It's a, it's a great review uh, that I'd refer everybody to. And the second part about it is not just understanding what the insula might do, 
but how the insula, because of its hyperconnectivity to all these regions, is involved in epilepsy spread patterns. And so how parts of the insula, like we talked about with the anatomy, can have frontal projections, very sylvian projections, temporal projections, and, and spasms and other things that we talked about um, towards the brainstem. So it's a framework to think about uh, insular uh, spread pathways. Now, from our perspective, uh, when we're thinking about the patients in surgery, um, you either identify those types of semiology, knowing that the scalp is not definitive or the MRI and the PET scan is lesional, that might also be suggestive. But then you talk about in which type of patients would you implant the insula? So in a scenario where there was a disconnect between the uh, semiology imaging, obviously uh, all those things would lead us to the insula, but I'm gonna talk about three other networks that are frequently missed. So, uh, and this discussion also comes in the case of surgical failures. And, and I think groups are now discovering when they're looking at their surgical failures and implant, implanting the insula that we're discovering it. So the first most common network is this temporal limbic uh, network. And, and this is where people talk about the insula being the great masquerader. And, and we know that there is a failure rate in classic mesotemporal lobe epilepsy, where you had hippocampal sclerosis and uh, uh, interictal PET hypometabolism and anterior temporal scalp EEGs. And, and those patients, some of them, 20, 30% of them fail. And, and those patients, uh, of course, uh, some of the hallmarks that have been identified if they had auditory hallucinations, rapid occurrence of mastication or uh, tonic-clonic face movements, uh, that has also been suggestive of insular temporal limbic uh, networks. So those obviously uh, on failure should be considered to have uh, insular implantation. The other one that's uh, uh, not an uncommon scenario is patients who have somatosensory auras or gustatory auras. Uh, the scalp might have suggested a frontal or parietal uh, network. Um, and those patients may even have gone some kind of resection based on grid uh, and strip electrode implantation. And those are patients that likely will benefit from a temporal uh, perisylvian or a uh, opercular type implant. Uh, and the last group uh, that's pointed out in the same uh, proposal scheme by SNART is the mesial and orbital frontal uh, for cryptogenic or uh, front, nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy, uh, something to consider that the frontal network can also easily be involved in insular epilepsy. So that I'm hoping is, uh, and then we can talk more about it during the discussion, is a framework on, on when to consider implantation with the insula. So obviously uh, a lot of attention to the semiology, both up front, uh, when things aren't corresponding, be proactive, uh, little things that we debate is when do you implant bilateral versus unilateral insula uh, because it, it is more electrodes and uh, not a lot of incremental risk, but a small amount of incremental risk, uh, which is also uh, of concern because there's actually a lot of bilateral connectivity uh, with both insulas. There's actually studies that have looked at cortical cortical evoked potentials and uh, the time between uh, signal transmission between the two insulas can be between eight to 20. Uh, milliseconds. So the goal of insular implantation is obviously to avoid uh, risk of injury to the middle cerebral artery branches, try to get maximum number of cortical electrodes to map out the insula. Um, this is an interesting question because there's good literature saying that you don't necessarily have to have complete insulectomies to have seizure freedom. You can have focal resections with good results, uh, and it's worth having that discussion. Um, and then, of course, try to both have electrode configurations, which you can actually map and, and guide uh, the resection. So, so with that, um, obviously, we know that grids and strips uh, are great, uh, but it doesn't give us a full uh, interrogation of the deep sulci. Uh, and really, to get good uh, coverage of the insula, you probably have to uh, split the sylvian fissure uh, so you can get uh, electrodes uh, deeper. Um, so I'm gonna just jump here in a second. Um, so a, a, a good grid and strip implantation, uh, if you're gonna explore both the opercular and insular surface uh, requires a little bit more uh, upfront uh, technical expertise, uh, which is probably also the reason that uh, for years, 
uh, without necessarily knowing upfront if somebody was going to have insular epilepsy. Uh, I think in the United States, we likely avoided it for, for most parts in the absence of lesional epilepsy. Um, and of course, there, there are multiple stereo EEG approaches. There's the TALREC method, which is a transopercular approach. Uh, and then there's an AFIF uh, method, uh, which includes oblique long axis implantation of the insula. Both are, are, uh, are published uh, really well. Both are shown to be very safe. Uh, they have the difference in how many contacts are actually uh, in the insula, uh, as well as the amount of deviation. When you're doing uh, two to three centimeter depth electrode implantations in a transopercular approach, the deviation is clearly less. When you're doing eight to 10 centimeter or longer oblique implantation, the deviation on the stereo EEG can be anywhere from three to four millimeters, which in a stereo EEG implantation, when you're traversing uh, multi, or are you getting close to traversing multiple pterachnoid planes could be an issue. Um, uh, having said that, uh, our preferred uh, approach uh, at Thomas Jefferson is the oblique approach. And, and I'll go a little bit through that. Um, so the orthogonal approach, uh, I think everybody's familiar with. Um, you have to go transulcal. If you want to get the electrodes um, in the uh, insula, uh, in our program, we will actually also get an angiogram and we will actually merge both the gadolinium MRI and the angiogram uh, together uh, when planning our trajectories. Um, that I'm gonna just give one comment about. I, I think that my preference is to trust the MRI more than the angiogram. The angiogram tends to give a little bit uh, different bloom artifact uh, when it's actually coupled with the angiogram CT, uh, but both are actually very helpful uh, because it just gives you additional different information. So as I mentioned that these are very precise and, and they're very safe. Um, our approach, like I mentioned, is this long axis. And uh, I don't know if the video will go through, uh, but you can uh, pause it there. So, so uh, one is through a higher parietal approach and another electrode that gets to the superior insula is through a parietal occipital approach. We basically, uh, start at the conflection point, uh, the posterior part of the insular triangle. Uh, we draw a line to the uh, anterior inferior insula and then project it backwards and then slowly micro adjust the target. And in a similar manner, we do it from the, we choose a point in the anterior superior insula to go to the MCA inflection point and project it posteriorly. Um, the anterior insular trajectory, which you're seeing here, uh, is usually easier to target with one exception. So the anterior insula trajectory, uh, if when you start planning it, you realize that the entry point ends up becoming very close uh, to the superior sagittal sinus, but because the electrode is angled away from the superior uh, sagittal sinus, uh, you usually, uh, in every scenario that we've done, so I won't say usually, uh, you can find an entry point which will avoid uh, the bridging veins, and you can usually give yourself three, four millimeters of clearance uh, at that point, so it's easily planable. The only complexity when you're doing this trajectory from anterior uh, to, to explore the medial part of the insula, the bowing of the insula is, is also highly variable. So from the anterior uh, sagittal approach, uh, again, you, you may have four or five contacts, but depending on how flat the insula is, uh, it's also something that may have limitation. So our general philosophy has been to do three, sometimes four electrodes, the fourth one being in the inferior, uh, in the middle part of the insular tetrahedron uh, triangle. And uh, with the intention that if there are focal regions, if the uh, epilepsy is confined to the superior part of the insula, the inferior part of the insula, so our, our general philosophy is that if you had an electrode somewhere in the middle, which was parallel with the middle cerebral artery, would you bias towards a temporal resection approach as opposed to a frontal resection approach as opposed to an anterior approach? So this exploration strategy uh, allows us to have a little bit more access to focal insular resections as opposed to having a broad-based insular resection in the situation of a... Um, non-lesional insular epilepsy. Um, and the last point that I'm gonna make about implantation is we will also leave uh, these electrodes for insular implantation as a fence, fence post. So we, we aim to resect 
a small thin layer of gray matter of the insula and, and looking to find uh, the electrodes. The real advantage of these electrodes that you can see this is this would be the sagittal anterior medial electrode. These would be the posterior electrodes is that it's actually out of the way of your craniotomy flap. So you can leave those electrodes in uh, for the remainder of the surgery. And that's also been described initially by the Japanese and, and recently uh, uh, Dennis Spencer and his group also published a very on, a nice online video uh, regarding that. So the fence post method is another uh, advantage uh, of the medial uh, approach. So um, this is our epilepsy team and, and a list of our, our fellows who have actually helped me uh, push the insular epilepsies forward. And, uh, and during the discussion, I'd be happy to answer uh, other questions. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Ash. That was great. Uh, you know, I think, as everyone knows, we, we generally focus on surgical techniques, but we can't really talk about something as complicated as the insula without speaking about aspects of semiology and implant. And that was great. Thank you so much. Our, our next speaker is uh, Massimo Kasu from Milan, who's going to speak with us about insular opercular resection. So Massimo, thank you so much. Thank you, Guy, and uh, thank you to all the other organizers of this webinar for giving me the opportunity to contribute with insular opercular resection. And the resection of insula was started in the last century, but was uh, quickly abandoned because of uh, significant morbidity. Then in the last decades, we had a growing and uh, renewing, renewed uh, interest in insular epilepsy surgery. And this is the, the figure of the curve of our <coughs> uh, resections involved in insula in the, in the last two decades with an increasing number of patients. This uh, may be the results of improvement in uh, uh, microsurgical techniques and other factors, but I want to focus on the uh, growing widespread use of steroid G and on the, the implementation of robotic techniques, I, which are ideal for insular sampling as Ash has demonstrated. And uh, I want to highlight that in our hands, uh, almost 60% of cases of insular uh, resections are performed after steroid G evaluation. Uh, pure insular resections are rare. Uh, this has been uh, uh, highlighted in this book that Arthur should know very well. And if you have a look at the most recent um, uh, studies on uh, this kind of, uh, of, uh, of, of, of surgery, you, you say that the, the word opercular insular or insular opercular section is, is very, very frequent. And um, in this uh, recent paper by uh, group with uh, a large experience in insular uh, resection, you, see, you can see that the selective insulectomy is reserved for a, a small percentage of patients. And the same uh, can be seen from our, our case series. Only 6% of patients with selective insulectomy and, and the large amount of patients who require insular percular resection, uh, which uh, involves both the insula and in various combinations, the superior, inferior, percular, or both. Massimo, may, excuse me for interrupting you. Some people are having trouble uh, with uh, looking at your PowerPoint presentation. It's fine for me, but would you mind just get, uh, turning it off and on again so people might be able to see it? Okay, that's right. Thank you. Does it work now? Looks good for me. Not sure for everybody, but it's good for me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Some of the panelists aren't seeing some people who are watching. It's fine on mine also. I'm not sure why it's not clear elsewhere. Why, why don't we try to unshare, Massimo? Uh, not, okay. Uh, unshare and share again. Let's try to do that. Perfect. And then share again. You know, for, for, for people out there, somebody said that they, that they logged off and back on. So maybe for people who are having trouble, log off and log back on and see if that helps make it clear. Yeah. Okay. It's fine with me. I think you should go ahead, Massimo. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. 
People Thank are saying it's a Zoom issue and that, so if you're having trouble, log off, log back on and it should be clear. Thank you, Massimo, sorry. Okay. So why insular opercular resections? There are uh, some reasons for that. And I want to share at least three with you. The first one is most epileptogenic insular lesions involve the opercula. And you can see here some examples both cortical malformations involving extensively the insula are also extended to the uh, to the opercula here and here, and also epileptogenic tumors have the same tendency to occupy both the insula and part of the opercula. So I want to share with you the first case, which is a case uh, uh, of the resection of uh, an anterior FCD, in a, an FCD located in the anterior opercular insular compartment. Uh, this is the, the case. You can see here the images. The FCD occupies the short uh, gyri and the central operculum. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, the video. I hope you can look at it easily. Uh, the resection begins with the opening of the cilium fissure that uh, uh, provides you an early uh, control of the insular plane, especially in this uh, region of the apex, which is more superficial. Then since the uh, strategy of the operculectomy is part of the, uh, of, this, um, of the resection, provides wider access to the insular plane, then gentle, gentle coagulation of the PA. We prefer to work between vessels uh, and transpial rather than subpial. And, and the low power, low power um, ultrasounds. And then a piecemeal resection. And this is the final. But I think that um, the more uh, interesting um, site for uh, opercular uh, insular resection uh, is the, posterior, the posterior part uh, of this uh, complex. Uh, this is another case. Uh, in which the resections uh, concerns uh, uh, an FCD located in the uh, posterior opercular insula. And uh, another, um, another thing that is that the, uh, uh, the limits of this uh, FCD are not well defined. We will see, we need some more to define properly the, uh, the strategy of resection. This is the case. And um, this is the presurgical planning, which is very important in this site because you, you have to study and to implement your navigation the relationships between the corticospinal and thalamocortical tracts. So we place uh, um, a strip over the sensory motor cortex to obtain both motor evoc potentials and somatosensor evoc potentials. This is a surgical field. Yeah. Oh, well, this is interesting. We put um, a strip over the operculum, but as you can see, it is very difficult from, uh, uh, with this mean uh, to obtain um, uh, uh, information about spiking because there, are, there is a, a lot of uh, background activity. So, uh, sorry. Sorry, I skipped. So let's make this go on. So it is difficult to see spiking with this mean. So we, we need something different. And this is our strategy is to place uh, uh, electrodes, so some contacts of uh, intracerebral electrodes, which are the same that we use for stereo AG inserts in the, in the cortex. And this is what we see. This is really prominent spiking, typical marker or, of uh, type two FCDs. You see in different sides of the perculum. This is what we see. And finally, in the most posterior part of the affected operculum, spiking. So we have an idea of which part of the operculum 
must be resected. Uh, splitting of the posterior part of the sylvian fissure provides uh, early gain to the posterior long gyrus, which is, uh, uh, and this is the, the section of the sulcus between the two, the two long gyri. It is important because sometimes you find that like in this case, uh, some arterial branches or M2 branches running in the bottom of this sulcus. So you have to identify them and then to uh, clearly uh, identify all the branches without retraction because this is dangerous because avulsions of uh, perforators or other branches may cause bleeding. And this is what you, you obtain with the splitting of the cilium fissure. But uh, as we said, the, the operculectomy may, may enhance the availability, availability in the surgical field of exposure of the insular plane and also of, this, of the anterior uh, long gyrus. You can see here resection. After resection of the opercula, you can, pay, you can uh, move on to the resection of the posterior long gyrus, like here. Even if you have tough tissue, you have to use very low power ultrasounds because it's very dangerous to fall too deep in this. In this. And, and this may be, may be a help, uh, neural navigation and subcortical stimulation for identifying how far you are from the corticospinal tract. Then additional, and this is the motor evoc potentials you have by stimulating subcortically, then additional mapping with the intracerebral electrodes in the anterior uh, limit of your operculectomy. There is still some spiking, so additional removing. And the uh, cortical, corticography in the short gyri, no spiking, and end of the procedure at, at this point. So there is a third reason for insular percular resection, which is not anatomical uh, in terms of pathology. It is not uh, epileptological, it is purely technical. And uh, this is that, uh, sorry, this is the epileptological reason. And that uh, it is that in most cases, the epileptogenic zone involves both the insula and opercular. This is an, a, there is growing, um, growing uh, evidence of this. And uh, this evidence stems from stereo G studies, mainly from stereo G studies. And as you can see from uh, small, uh, these four examples, but there are many, many others in the literature that when you study <clears throat> this kind of patients with stereo G, uh, in most of them, the, uh, the ictal discharge begins and starts in the uh, in, in the insula and the opercular at the same time, and they result in the, uh, these evidence results in resections that uh, involve both the insula and the operculum. So this is the last case I want to show you. The case number three is a child, an 11 year old child with multiple daily seizures whose semiology uh, indicates an hypothesis for a left perisylvian region, EAG was congruent with this <coughs> hypothesis, but we had no lesions on the MRI. The MRI was completely uninformative. So this patient was uh, studied with uh, stereo G disease. Uh, they implanted, they, they were, there are many transopercular uh, electrodes, both suprasilian and uh, infracilian, which explore both the opercular and the insula regions. And you can see here the trace in the purple, you can see the uh, insular uh, contacts and uh, in black, the opercular ones. And this is the onset of the seizure. You, you can see that the ictal discharge starts almost um, at the same time in the insula and in the operculum. So the surgical strategy was indicated by the epileptologist was, was removal of the uh, of the uh, operculum and of the uh, uh, subjacent uh, insula explored by the electrodes R and S. This is 
the video. This is a surgical field with the cortical traces of the electrodes. And uh, uh, the perculectum is, uh, this, uh, in, in this case, we do not split the civilian tissue because we, the civilian fissure, because we don't need to expose widely. So we are, uh, the need is only to expose the insula under the opercolectomy. And this, is, this can be done with gentle retraction of the operculum, the deepest cortex of the operculum, identification of the M2 branches, and uh, looking for the superior limiting sulcus, which you can see here, that has been identified. And then this is a dissection of a lesion of the radiofrequency lesion performed during stereogy. This is a good, a uh, good thing to, to find uh, these lesions because they, they can serve as landmarks for your resection. So uh, for the uh, operculectomy and uh, additional exposure of the insular plane, we have to peel the section carefully. And it is important to spare the white matter, which is located cranial to the insular roof because it it uh, contains the uh, aquate fasciculus. We are in the left side here. So this is the preserved wet matter. And it is very important not to injure this, not to, uh, to injure these structures. Transpial, gentle transpial approach for uh, taking sun specimens for histology. This not always easy to, uh, to, to find some pathology from so small specimen, but this is what is available from this kind of resections, then gentle uh, aspiration with ultrasound, low setting and highly, sel and, uh, highly selective mode and working between, uh, between vessels and removing until you see, you, we can see the wet matter or the extreme capsule here once you have reached this, you have down the insular cort 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 corticectomy. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I was telling before, there is a third reason why you per we perform so many insular percolar sections, which is uh, purely technical. And uh, it is that maybe that uh, a transopercular approach is better. You gain a better insular control uh, in this, very elegant study by the San Francisco University. It was on. Uh, uh, it was conducted on uh, um, cadaveric specimens. It was found that both insular exposure, which is, uh, which is the area you can see of the insula, uh, the surgical window that is the corridor in which you can insert your instruments, and the surgical freedom, which is the area in which you can move freely your instrument, are enhanced by uh, uh, a transopercular approach compared with a pure transivian approach. So uh, from this point of view, uh, it is, it seemed that it, it could be uh, uh, preferable a transopercular approach. There is another reason, uh, which is the uh, venous pattern uh, of the peninsular region. Uh, in this case, th these are all left uh, carotidograms. And you can see that this pattern is favor favorable for uh, in civilian fissure splitting because all the peninsular veins uh, run away from the civilian fissure. But in this case, and in this case, it will be very difficult to open freely the civilian fissure without sacrifice of some of these uh, of these bridging veins. So how many and which of them can maybe sacrifice without achieving a, a complication? And so in this case, it's maybe that uh, transopercular approach to the insula, maybe uh, the only viable option irrespective of, of which you have uh, uh, pathological or etiological or epileptological reasons to remove the operculum. And Something about uh, uh, intraoperative monitoring. Uh, intraoperative monitoring is uh, mandatory in this kind of uh, in this kind of surgery. Uh, motor pathway and sensitive pathway monitoring has been uh, described uh, fully in, uh, in, in previous webinars, and uh, uh, the uh, 
the debate uh, of whether to perform them in awake patient in awake condition and in uh, uh, under uh, general anesthesia is still open, but uh, no way to uh, that the language uh, uh, monitoring with the cooperation of the patient must be performed in awake conditions. But do we have uh, the possibility to monitor language? Uh, in a uh, uh, sleeping patient with under, under general anesthesia, the uh, answer is that maybe yes, uh, by, by using the cortic cortical evoked potentials, which are uh, potentials with, uh, which are recording by stimulating remote cortical sites and recording from uh, other cortical sites. They are marked, th these potentials are marker of the connectivity between remote cortical sites. And by stimulation they recorded from anterior and posterior language areas, we can uh, uh, record CCAP, which assess the integrity of the dorsal language pathway, which is the adequate vesicle. What is, is important for us is the first component of this waveform, the N1 uh, wave. And uh, it has been found that uh, uh, CCP may be used intraoperatively uh, for uh, perisivian tumoral cases. And in some cases, the procedure has been performed under general anesthesia. The advantages of the technique is it is, uh, are that it is completely task-free no cooperation from the patient, no passive task um, must, be, uh, must be delivered. And uh, that the, uh, the stimulation parameters are very are ideal for epileptic patients because they uh, are low frequency pulses and single pulse stimulation, which lower the risk of induced seizures uh, 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 during the procedure. This is how we uh, place the uh, strips for stimulation and recording in the posterior uh, T1 and the posterior R3. We can record from the anterior language uh, areas by stimulating, the by stimulating the posterior or vice versa, depending <laughs> on the stability and uh, reproducibility of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the potentials. This is our experience and we have uh, performed uh, in, a, in a small court of patients uh, uh, this monitoring um, of the dorsal language path in epilepsy surgery under general anesthesia. No problems, no adverse events during uh, the procedure. Uh, a mild decrease of the N1 amplitude provides, uh, is, is not associated with post-operative deficits, but uh, if we double this decrease in, under, in uh, amplitude, we have observed some transient post-operative speech disturbances with complete recovery. We have concluded that this may be an opportunity for patients uh, we are, who are unfitted to awake surgery, especially children and uh, other uncooperative un patients. We have some points to be clarified, uh, uh, um, namely the threshold of at the end one amplitude decrease for permanent speech impairment is not known. We have no permanent speech disturbances, so we, we couldn't check for this. And we are implementing the subcortical stimulation and cortical recording for assessing the proximity of the uh, arcuate fasciculum. And, and finally, some, uh, some comments on complication. Uh, resecting the opercular insular region is a, 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 an independent uh, uh, risk factor for neurological complication. And nevertheless, uh, the neurolog neurological complications associated to insular opercular surgery have decreased uh, over the years in our center, maybe for several reasons, but uh, <coughs> we have uh, 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 growing experience in this kind of surgery. We have uh, uh, implemented uh, uh, advanced pre-surgical planning and introduced a new protocol for uh, intraoperative monitoring. But the more feared complication is vascular complication. Uh, in these images, you see what it is not an uh, unwanted uh, extension of the resection through the corona radiata. These are ischemic sequelae of uh, which are due to the injury of perforating arteries. You can see then that branch from the M2 or M3 or sometimes also M4 branches of the, of the MCA. And uh, uh, the, uh, there are uh, um, 
different, uh, uh, there are uh, perforating arteries of different, uh, um, different cores of, it, of different uh, uh, measure and the, the long ones with that, which are a, ma a minority uh, supply the corona radiata. And when these arteries are situated in the posterior part of the uh, opercular insular complex, they might, uh, they might supply the corticospinal tract. So the ischemic, the damage from these arteries may be uh, may result in a severe uh, deficit the problem is that you don't see these arteries on conventional vascular imaging and it is also very very difficult to see them intraoperatively it's quite quite difficult and even if you can suspect that some of these as you can see in these pictures uh, may be uh, uh, perforating arteries you never know where they are going to go where if they perfuse or not the corticospinal tract. So it is very difficult to, um, uh, to, to manage uh, surgery, in, in the, especially in the posterior part of the opercular insular complex. Um, I want to, uh, to thank these guys, uh, Michele Rizzi, Calida Lorabi for video editing, and Ivana Sartori and Martina Evai for the slides. And thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Massimo. That was a great presentation. And I'm sure there's going to be plenty of questions generated for, for the two of you. you know. I think that uh, maybe I'll start where you where you finished, which is, what are your particular strategies to minimize risk in the posterior superior insula to those exact perforating arteries that you were showing us? Yeah, this is a great uh, question, will which would deserve a great answer, but I have not, I have not a definite uh, answer. You know, so, sometimes you, you see that those arteries, they are very tiny and it's very difficult to recognize them. Sometimes you recognize them then when they are already in your suction tube and it is too late. Uh, I think that, I, 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 I say that when I see some of these arteries and I suspect that they that may, may supply the corona radiata, I try to, to make as, a, as gentle as possible the section around these arteries. Do not use uh, ultrasonic aspiration uh, and uh, uh, be uh, as uh, gentle as possible uh, at the bottom of the uh, superior peninsular, uh, peninsular uh, sulcus. But uh, Sometimes you have no defense against this against this artist because it's very very difficult to see them. And one other technical question: so, for your trans, because the case you showed your transopercular dissection, which was a beautiful case, you you were approaching from the superior side of the sylvian fissure to to get to the operculum. Do you find when you operate transopercularly, do you generally have to make windows on both sides of the fissure or can you reach down from superiorly and get all the way inferiorly? Okay, it depends on where is the lesion, where is the seizure onset zone and which is, which is your strategy and how much of the insular plane you need to be uh, exposed. Uh, Usually, I perform only the superior operculectomy because it is, uh, if if it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you want to remove a seizure onset zone that includes the superior operculum, and uh, um, if it is, if there is no reason, no reason, no epileptological reason or pathological reason to remove also the inferior. Operculum, the temporal operculum, I leave it intact. And also it related in the same area. The 11 year old, the third case was a dominant, presumably, resection. And 
you know, you, you're talking about language CCEPs, but what about the aspect of dominant face motor and the, the risk of, of, of dysarthric speech or speech production rather than language per se? So, so how are you mapping for that in the sleep patients where you're doing language CCEPs? Uh, well, we do not map for this. Uh, uh, although that uh, uh, the occurrence of dysarthria in that area, operating in that area is maybe high. And uh, we have also sometimes a deficit of the, of the inferior phase, but in our experience, you have a very, very quick recovery from those, uh, uh, from those, uh, uh, from those deficits. So uh, basically it is not a problem for us. So, so dominant or non-dominant face? Dominant or non-dominant, uh, yes. You know, uh, we, be we believe that uh, uh, the cortical representation is bilateral and there is usually a quick recovery from from this atria or, uh, um, or, or weakness in the inferior face uh, or swelling and everything that is represented in that area in both dominant and non-dominant side. Yeah. And, 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 and Ash, a quick question for you before we open it up and get, 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 get Arthur going. It's, uh, so, you know, when, you, when you, your triangular uh, boundaries of the insula give you obviously the outside parts of the triangle, but as Massimo was showing with the electrode, in, uh, and you also had one, the, how often are you putting the in-between electrode? And do you ever consider just trying to aim your electrodes down the individual gyri rather than a triangular approach if you're going obliquely? Uh, so we put uh, four electrodes, not infrequently. If I have a, uh, a really bowed out insula where I can't actually map it out, then I, then I put that fourth electrode in. Because you can, the medial approach, the anterior sagittal approach, I think is a little bit safer uh, in general. And, and the deviation isn't high, but there are some insular anatomies, you know, that aren't as amenable to it. Um, and, and if we're really doing an insular resection, um, you know, interestingly enough, I, we, when you put the four electrodes in, when you put one right in the middle, you will actually bias a superior frontal opercular resection versus a temporal resection. Um, so we will go for both sides of the insula, um, you know, in non-lesional cases. Um, so that, that's where we make the, that, that's where we're more likely to go for electrodes uh, in general. Massimo, I wanted to go back and circle one question though. When you're doing the posterior resections, um, you know, in our program, we've only done uh, lesional posterior resections, but um, how often will you also go through the sensory cortex? You know, not just a frontal motor opercular resection, but a, a sensory parietal opercular resection to get post, is there any advantage to that? To get to the posterior window. <clears throat> okay, uh, you know the problem is uh, not um, to have full control of the of how you uh, reach the full control of the insular plane, but rather what you need to remove uh, to get a, a, a favorable outcome on seizures. So. Uh, I think that you have to tailor your your approach. If you need to remove the posterior, the posterior, the postcentral operculum, there's a part of the supramarginal gyrus. If this does not imply um, complication, you can you can do it even for getting a more uh, um, a more favorable control of the insular plane. But this is uh, uh, you know uh, the the main the main goal is to remove what is epileptogenic and to find the, 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 best, the best way to do it. Um, and so. And, and, and Ash, along those lines, you know, Massimo was showing in their large series how many of these cases are insular opercular. So when you are implanting your oblique insular strategy, how are you making sure that you cover enough of the adjacent operculum? Um, so I, I didn't necessarily clarify that, but if like there's somebody with auditory auras, then they will have to get both medial and transopercular electrodes. So it would be a hybrid. It wouldn't be one or the other. It would be both. I, I 
may I say something? I completely agree with you. And uh, um, I must say that uh, an hybrid uh, uh, strategy is the best one. Also, um, uh, considering that the epilep at least our epile epileptologists say that it is important when uh, uh, recording patients with bipolar derivations, it is very important the direction of the dipole. So in the same zone covered by a uh, an oblique electrode and a transopercular electrode, you can have different patterns of, uh, epileptog of uh, uh, epileptic form um, activity um, uh, based on the different directions of the two contacts in bipolar derivation in an oblique or a trans transopercular one. And um, this, um, I, I think this uh, uh, discrepancy may be balanced by the adoption of the hybrid approach. And, and maybe both of you two could comment because you know before we started Massimo, you were talking on how much of your role now as a senior clinician is training of younger clinicians in some of these advanced surgeries. And maybe the two of you could both comment on the learning curve in this sort of surgery and how do you minimize patient risk by people saying, I have to learn this. I'm a young faculty person. I didn't really see it in my training. So how do we go about training people in insular surgery in the way that is safe for our patients? Do you want to start, Massimo? OK. Oh. The, it's difficult to. To, uh, to, to, to give a definite answer, but training is a step-by-step -step procedure. And I think that uh, in, this kind, in any kind of surgery, you have to put things together. You, you have to, 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 to learn uh, uh, how to remove the opercula, how to expose properly the insular cortex, and then to, you can move on to more um, complicated to more complex uh, uh, insulectomies. Uh, well, uh, the, the problem is not to leave people alone, to, 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 to stay aside from the younger people and to uh, patient and to teach them and to correct them. I, I think there is not a rule. In our program, I think it's a great question, Guy, and thank you for asking it, really. Um, so, you know, in my in my program, the gliomas are done by the tumor guys, and some cavernomas in the insula are done by the vascular guys. So when we first started, so we've done I think 12, 13. We haven't done a, a hundred insular resections, but um, so I will actually do the jointly surgery with both the tumor and the vascular guys. They're in that region a little bit more. They Hopefully, I mean, they're used to distorted anatomy when we're looking at less distorted anatomy. So I think combined surgery and getting the judgment of a, of a colleague. Now in my program, I'm considered reasonably senior, but I'll still do it with our tumor and vascular surgeons when it comes to the, the resection. Um, and so I think that's when people are starting out programs. There's no way anybody's gonna have a lot of insular resection uh, experience. So there, there's no harm in getting that little extra for the patient. So then, and, and also it's probably from a liability perspective, also better because at least two people made the judgment call to make a decision if a hard decision regarding a vessel or vein had to be made. The second thing is um, in our program, when we're doing a lot of long axis insular trajectories, um, since we use the O-arm in the operating room, our workflow is that we drill the bolts, then we do a spin to see if our bolt accuracy was projected to where we wanted the target to be. So it's another little check that we have when we're doing long axis insular trajectories. Arthur Bertel, questions, comments? Oh, I, 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 I could uh, keep <laughs> discussing this for the whole day, but <laughs> I'll have to keep it short though. Uh, why don't you, Ash and Massimo, give us what would be your dream uh, insular coverage? or SCG, could you decide on, uh, you know, uh, a number of uh, targets and electrode that you use that most of us could use? How, how, how would uh, a dream-like uh, uh, hybrid model work for you? What would be the electrodes and the targets? Not non-lesional, Arthur? Yeah, non-lesional, yeah. 
So I, I think that, uh, so we will do uh, four, you know, three long axis medial electrodes and then one long axis anterior uh, and then transcortical. So depending on if it's the semiology is more frontal or temporal, that's where we would bias the electrodes. And then depending on if it's an orbital frontal, cingulate or temporal network, we'll have the additional electrodes covering those. But, but it's, a, it's a great question because it's worth actually having a picture in future slides to look at what our preferential, you know, because there's only three or four different general strategies um, of mapping. But, but then you, you, you have three obliques and how many orthogonal? Uh, three obliques and uh, six orthogonal. <clears throat> okay. What about you, Masma? Yeah. Well, um, I believe that Stereo G is not a 1020 montage. Uh, I think that um, I think that uh, you you must individualize, you must tailor your exploration according to the indication of your epileptologist based on the semiology, based on SCG, um, on EG, on ectal EG, based on pathology. If you have, or you know, there is not a rule in our center for this. There is not a, a, a definite number of obliques. Sometimes we do not place obliques. And uh, <clears throat> sometimes uh, you use only two, three transopercular, or in the case I've shown you, there were eight transopercular erythroids and no, no obliques. It depends. So you're not giving us a dream uh, no. standard <laughs> implantation. That, oh, I, I was about to to love it, but that's fine. <laughs> uh, uh, the, the other issue is, um, of course, there is gaining interest in doing what you're doing re by open resection using uh, stereotactic procedures like laser or radio frequency. Uh, would you both comment on the, the relative uh, usefulness of radio frequency, laser ablation, and open microsurgery for this kind of patients? I'll let uh, Massimo, if you have it. We, we have not done uh, radio frequency or laser in the insula. Um, so I don't have a good opinion on it. Okay, we have uh, uh, limited experience with uh, radio frequency. Um, um, radio frequency is a palliative, uh, is a palliative uh, uh, procedure because you do not uh, destroy all the epileptogenic zone, but just some nodes which are uh, accessible through the stereo G electrodes. Uh, another question is laser, laser uh, ablations guided by, C by ICG. There are a few experiences in literature about this. And I, I must say that, that, that they are promising. Um, and the, the results are, are, are encouraging and, uh, you know, but uh, it is, uh, you know, from a neurosurgical point of view, the opercular insular region is hell, it's a hellish place. So uh, you must also consider that sometimes you cannot perform coagulation wherever you want because you have vascular constraints and you have uh, all, also um, uh, functional constraints uh, related to the um, to the connectivity which lies below and uh, uh, in the neighboring of the Israel percolar region. So we must be very very careful. I think that at present uh, uh, the gold standard is, is still microsurgery. Uh, you know, uh, Ar Arthur, I just I just brought on for the same topic. If Bob Gross would be willing to comment because. He probably has more cases of insular laser ablation and particularly on volume control and short and long-term side effects slash complications of laser in your experience in this region. Cause I know there's, there's not, there's, there's handfuls of cases here and there. So could you comment on your experience, Bob? Uh, the, 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 uh, first thing, the first thing, Bob, you have to explain for us this technique of using a mask because it was just hanging on your left ear. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I will explain uh, to you also that I live in a part of the country where masks are not mandatory, uh, but where cases of the Delta variant are skyrocketing exponentially. So 
Uh, so I'm at the gym and I am the only person wearing a mask here, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, if you are using it like this, yeah, yeah. probably not good enough, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no, that's classic. Um, all right, well, thank you, uh, Guy, for asking me about this. I know we've talked about this recently. Um, yeah, you know, you're right about a handful of cases. We've done a handful of cases, uh, literally, um, of laser ablation in this area. I'll st first start uh, by picking up on Massimo's radio frequency ablation. So we've done a number of RF ablations in the insula, um, uh, both uh, oblique and uh, orthogonal. And, you know, I agree completely with RF ablation. You have, you know, we always look to see if there's a blood vessel nearby um, and that will limit the ablation because thermal spread can, can potentially damage the vessels. Um, and that's certainly what we do with RF. Um, with laser, you know, of course, we're dealing with the same M2 branches that you're dealing with open. Um, it's, it's been remarkably safe in our five or six cases um, with respect to hemorrhages. We've had none and, and even thrombotic injury uh, to MCAs. And, and I think probably that's a technical um, aspect of um, the laser and that is that all those vessels are surrounded by some cerebral spinal fluid also would be um you know they're they're in the cistern for the most part and and also that the laser power is of course um depending on the laser you use in a very you know in a one particular nanometer range so 1024 for example that uh, does not tend to damage blood, blood vessels. We've been very close to blood vessels in many different situations uh, and not had any injuries. So the laser light is not taken up. And then you're dealing with thermal spread and the thermal spread is mitigated by having the heat sinks. But we certainly keep the, the uh, uh, ablation parameters very mild, um, you know, 50, 60% maybe um, uh, for, uh, for the parameters. And we use multiple tracks, uh, three, sometimes four tracks. Um, as far as complications go, um, we've had uh, one, actually my last one, uh, which was, as I think Guy pointed out, a very large ablation ultimately, uh, and um, she developed uh, edema spreading into the corticospinal tract um, and is, uh, is recovering from that uh, without any, any infarct. Um, so yeah, you have to be certainly careful about the size of the ablations you do. Um, ideally, it would be a limited ablation rather than the whole insula, but from time to time in the non-regional cases, that's the situation you find yourself in. Um, we've not, aside from that, we have not as yet had any complications, but I do tell patients that you know, if I've done five of them without any complications, the complication rate has to assume that the sixth one uh, has a complication. And then it goes from 0% to 16% uh, in one case. So, so that's what we tell the patients. But of course, we have to um, contrast that with uh, the complications of open surgery. Um, and also the fact, as, as asked just alluded to, uh, we too have limited open experience in that area. Um, so we're not like uh, the European centers that have done many open surgeries. I will note, though, that um, Stefan Chabardez's series on uh, insular opercular resections open um, was limited to right side. They did not do any left side. And it's certainly in the left side of cases that we're, we're more concerned. Um, uh, Dave Clark has a series of 20 patients that was published several years ago of insular ablations um, with um, you know, some, some adverse effects that we expect from operating in this area, but, I, uh, uh, but they're relatively safe. But our experience is very young. And uh, we have to be careful and, and be cognizant of the fact that, you know, things could change with the next case or the next couple of cases. That said, um, I have a, a young woman, um, uh, actually an English teacher, um, who um, had, uh, has polymicrogyria extending over this whole area for non-dominant hemisphere, um, who we did extensive radio frequency ablations um, about four or five months ago, and she went from daily seizures to being seizure-free for three months um, and then recurred, and we have her coming in this week for, uh, for laser ablation to uh, hopefully uh, um, get a good response. But certainly, uh, it's, it's encouraging with just RF ablation to the insular region. 
in our in our RF ablation series, we haven't had anybody that has become seizure free from RF ablations in the insular though. And these are all non regional cases. Bertel, I think you had a comment. Yeah, I have I have a comment on that. And uh, we recently started with those thermal ablations, and a uh, uh, little bit uh, about a year ago, a younger colleague of mine operated for uh, a young boy for a dysplasia in the left uh, anterior insular parietal region, and it was a verified dysplasia, and the boy went all right for two months and then uh, there was a recurrence of severe si situation. After that first surgery, it was possible to identify a part with dysplasia in part of the insula. And then he did a loss of thermal ablation of that part. And that is something like seven, eight months ago with excellent result, no complication and seizure free. But that is of course a single case, but we just started it up. So, so but that was very rewarding, I think. So you're saying there, there was a hybrid approach here in that case yeah, where yeah, yeah. It was, an anterior yeah. resection and then a posterior ablation? Yeah, instead of open reoperation, uh, we did a, a loss of thermal ablation. So that was kind of a hybrid approach, yes. Mas Massimo, you have a vast experience, you know, at, at in Milan with, with, with RF ablation as a technique through SEEG to help predict which patients are going to potentially benefit from surgery, even if they're not seizure free. If somebody's non-lesional and you do an SEEG and they don't get better with RF ablation, does that mean they're no longer an open surgical candidate in your hands? No, not necessarily. Uh, we also, we uh, obviously counsel the, pa the patient about this that uh, in terms of prognosis, pro prognosis, the prognosis is less favorable if no response has been achieved by thermocoagulations, even a transient response. And, but this is not necessarily uh, hampers the, an, indi an indication for, for resective surgery. Do you, do you tell them in that case, do you think they have a lower chance of seizure freedom if they don't improve with RF? Well, the, the, there, is no, uh, no, there is no proof of this. Uh, you, you, you must, you have uh, uh, investigated our, our, our case series, but there is no uh, significant uh, uh, evidence that uh, response is associated uh, with uh, um, with a good uh, results of, of resective surgery, but um, uh, you know maybe that this is due mainly uh, to the mm, we have not enough patients. Maybe we have not en enough enough cases. Uh, it, it is very different to achieve uh, statistical significance if you have. Uh, uh, hundreds of patients or, or thousands of patients instead of the dozens of, of patients. It's very, it's very difficult. We have the impression that it is a good predictor, a good predictor, but there is no statistical significance. And, and I must say that also other groups that uh, have investigated this issue are not, uh, are not, have, have not provided the significant uh, date, date, data about this. But it is an impression. We are much more. We are much happier to operate on, on, on patients. We have uh, achieved uh, even a partial seizure control or temporary or transient uh, seizure control than patients who have not. But patients who have not are not denied surgery at all. Yeah, I think you know, Bertel. To follow up on your case. I think it's going to be very interesting as people understand more about the limits and the safety of RF and laser ablation. You know, maybe people will be moving more towards anterior resections with posterior ablation over time because of the fact that, you know, the posterior part is more dangerous. And for the reasons yeah. you showed, Massimo, and I think it's going to be fascinating because as you showed 20 years ago, there was very little insular epilepsy surgery and actually very little insular glioma surgery. And now they're both increasing but they're increasing relatively cautiously. And I think the other comment that Ash made, you know, you are, you are fortunate at your hospital to have one of the best insular low-grade glioma surgical teams in the world. 
And so you have that group of expertise right there. You know, I personally straddle those, those two worlds clinically, but I think it's really important for us as epilepsy surgeons to partner and learn from the low-grade glioma surgeons who work in the insula, because the reality is there's more insular gliomas than there is insular epilepsy in terms of what we're seeing. Yeah, and uh, yeah, in this direction, uh, the insular cortex is not a good candidate for an epilepsy focus because it's it's a small chunk of uh, cortex. It doesn't have an amplifier like an hippocampus and things like that. So, but anyway, we are talking more and more about it. You could argue that uh, this is related to the availability of SCG outside Europe, and then that we are sampling the insula and now we are paying attention to it. But this is does not apply to you, right, Massimo? Because you have SCG from the beginning, and you still see uh, an increasing number of uh, cases, insular cases being done. So, why is that you have such a steep uh, curves in terms of number of insular uh, resections in your place, since you have SCG from the beginning? You know? Yes, but you know, it, even for SCG. In the, at the beginning of our program, the insula were considered uh, inaccessible. We, uh, I remember that uh, we had the, uh, um, only the possibility with the, whole, the old Tylerac method, we had only the possibility to place electrodes orthogonal to the sagittal plane with a double grid system. So accessibility to the insula was limited because we had fixed tra trajectories. And uh, second, uh, we felt that uh, uh, violating the, uh, the violation, the uh, entering in the sylvian fissure was, was very, very dangerous. And we didn't perform um, insular uh, uh, exploration. We didn't put electrodes in the insula. We started with the, with the, the robotic assistance to place uh, more and more electrodes in the insula. And this happened uh, approximately 12, 15 years ago, 12, maybe 12 years ago. So this explains the steep increase of the, of the insular pericular sections in our center. But I think the other thing, Massimo, you know, that you stressed in your talk is that the majority of your onsets are not pure insular unless there's an insular lesion, they're insular opercular, right? Yes, that's right. And, uh, you know, um, this, uh, but this is an, not only our impression, I don't know the other panelists or something, in the, someone in the audience that could comment on this, but uh, I think that uh, uh, what uh, Ash uh, um, showed us about the connection of the insular, the different insular, uh, insular regions, uh, um, the connection with the opercular are very strict, and the opercular are the closest, uh, the closest structures connected to the insula. So it is not surprising that something that uh, 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 as is onset in the insular cortex or within the opercular can have a, a reciprocal spread to the other structure. It is not, it is not surprising for me. You know, I think one thing that's fascinating is we have, our turnouts for these videos are very strong. And we had many, many people here from all over the world. And this is probably the first topic where the questions have been very, very limited. And I think part of that is that this is an area of the brain that is still relatively new to exploration. And I think there are, is a lot, a lot less global experience in this area. And it's incumbent upon us as a field to make sure that we bring it forward in a responsible and safe way. That's right, I agree completely. Yeah, very well said. Can you uh, ask a question then uh, regarding, I asked this on the chat, but just, just in terms of the logistics that uh, is, is, is there any reason you're not appearing, Bob, or is... Uh, <laughs> He's doing okay. a bench press. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will. All right, here we go. While I'm doing my uh, workout. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> that is functional uh, neurosurgery at its best. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get it, it, strong it, it, like it, tumor surgeon. 
it, it, it means you do you do not use a mask when you are not exercising and you use a mask when you are exercising right <laughs> Um, okay, anyway, just in terms, final question. In terms of the logistics, because we contend with this also, when we when we really think it's opercular insular in a non non regional case, uh, and you're looking at three, and you've even said four electrodes down the insula obliquely, but you also have to get the opercular ones, so you're looking at another three. You know, you're talking about six, seven electrodes for one side, and then, as many people have pointed out, you can have spread you know, within milliseconds to the contralateral side. Um, so you're looking at, you know, 16 electrodes just in the opercular insular region. Um, but of course it's non-lesional, so you have other hypotheses as well, because this is the great masquerader. So how do you contend with those numbers, you know, Ash, in terms of, uh, do you do two separate implants? Are you only doing them unilaterally? Yeah, and so uh, most that? of the time we're, we're heavily biased to one side. Um, it's very, uh, I have put in, three insular electrodes oblique on both sides, um, you know, in a case that was, had zero localizing, lateralizing features. Uh, but in general, you have some lateralization feature and then you will clearly bias your strategy toward that side. Um, never had to go back and re-implant or add extra electrodes to the contralateral side. So in general, the approach is sound, uh, but I won't go really hard both sides if I don't have to. I mean Philippe Kahan argues that in, in basically all cases, you need to implant bilaterally if it's non regional. Yeah. I find that really hard to completely fathom. Yeah. It's a lot of electrodes. Uh, yeah. With a, uh, you're looking at a very tiny percentage of people that you would pick up by all those electro, extra electrodes. Massimo, what is your experience with that? <clears throat> very, very few bilateral. I think that the pro, that the question of the lateralization of the of the epileptogenic zone should be in most cases uh, de, de defined before you perform the strategy, and you have to 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 gain all the information you need to keep uh, the number of electrodes, uh, even in monolateral cases, as low as possible. I, I think that's a good take home point for us to end on if, any, if nobody has any further questions or comments. I just comment on the fact guy that we completed a year of ESTM uh, webinars. <laughs> so, and uh, it was a wonderful journey and I think uh, many of us benefit from that. And just a reminder, a reminder to anyone who's still on all of the past presentations, as well as this one and future ones are all online on the ESTM website, the link. So if you need to go back and hear any other aspects of these amazing talks again, go back onto the website and rewatch them, have your trainees and your, I think your neurologist watch them also. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> at, at, at <laughs> thank you very, very much for two outstanding thank, talks. Thank you to thank all you. of you. Thank Have you. a good summer.